Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And today I would like to talk about this paper I came across called The Synthesis of Complex Audio Spectra by Means of Discrete Summation Formulae. It's from 1975. So let's start with this formula down here. So basically this gives a way to produce a series of sinusoids. So it's kind of like additive synthesis, but we're wanting to avoid having to actually add up a bunch of sinusoids so we can use this convenient formula. This discrete summation formula business goes in the general category of abstract synthesis methods, where you're looking for a computationally convenient way of generating spectra that vary over time according to a small number of varying parameters. So here we have a parameter a. I'll note that a needs to be less than 1. And that number less than 1 is being taken to a power of k. So it starts at k equals 0. So you will always get a fundamental that's basically sine theta. This is actually a little bit complicated when I say fundamental. That's assuming that this beta is set along with this theta to give you harmonically related partials. But you could set theta and beta to give you inharmonic partials where the betas are all kind of harmonically related to each other, but the lowest partial is inharmonic relative to the rest. We'll take a look at that. Other forms of abstract synthesis include the phase distortion used in the Casio CZ line of synthesizers and frequency modulation synthesis as made famous by Yamaha, but also used in instruments like the Synergy and the Synclavier as well as the Buchla 300, 400, and 700. So this formula has a theta and a beta, and I'm going to follow the advice of the paper and set theta to 2 pi FCT and beta to 2 pi FMT. So FC we're thinking of as a center frequency and FM as a modulating frequency, but I want to emphasize this is just kind of an analogy to the formula. This is not FM synthesis. This FM isn't actually modulating a carrier in the way that FM synthesis does. Okay, so here's my MATLAB code. Technically, I'm running this in Octave, which is an open source version of MATLAB. So you can download and run Octave for free. And I'll also include my code in the description below. So I would encourage you to experiment with this yourself. So I'm loading the signal package in so I can run the spectrogram command here. I'm going to specify a sample rate of 48,000 samples per second. And once we're done creating the sound, which I'm putting in the XX variable, we're going to play it back at that sample rate. Note that Octave or MATLAB is going to take your sound at whatever sample rate and then do a sample rate conversion to play it back at whatever the native sample rate of your audio system is. It's not going to change the sample rate of the actual DAC in your computer. I'm also plotting the spectrogram. The second argument here is the window size. And I'm also just going to plot the signal, although at this scale, you're just going to see the envelope. So here I'm creating a set of time tick marks spaced with a period of 1 over the sample rate that will give us 10 seconds. So I'm going to start with a so-called carrier frequency and so-called modulation frequency of 110 hertz. So I'm going to set those to be the same. So that's a low A. Here I compute the theta and the beta. And I'm spelling beta with two t's because there's a built-in function beta with one t. So I have two options for an envelope for our parameter A. The option I currently have selected is that I'm using this linspace command to linearly space A going from 0 to 0 0.9 halfway through its length. And then I reverse that so it will go up and then go back down. There's an alternative version here which just decreases throughout the extent of the time. And here is where I actually compute that function. In MATLAB syntax, putting a dot in front of the times or a dot in front of the divide indicates an element-wise operation. Same thing with a dot in front of the caret. So this will give us a squared in terms of each individual element. If you don't have that dot there, 
it will do some sort of matrix algebra thing, which is usually not what you want in this context. Okay, enough of that. What does the sound like? So that had a bit of a sawtoothy kind of vibe to it. Let me change this to 220. So now we should be generating odd harmonics. So that's a little more square wavy. Let's see, what if I change this to 55, our modulation frequency? Okay, so that's giving us something that technically has a fundamental of 55, but this isn't like FM where you get sidebands on each side, we only get upper sidebands. So it's kind of like the fundamental is missing. Let me change our carrier frequency here to 55 also. I'm hearing some aliasing in all of those examples, especially that last one. Let me try changing the sample rate to 9600. You know what? Okay, this is a complete conjecture. I'm wondering if the denominator here gets close to zero then this whole thing starts to have numeric problems. There's probably some sort of L'Hopital trick we could use on this to get a version of this formula that's more accurate numerically when the denominator is close to zero. That's a complete conjecture. This would require further study. If you have any thoughts about that, please leave a comment below. Let me see what this sounds like if I use one of these purely decaying envelopes. So let me do this. And I'm also gonna set the sample rate back to 4,800. Let's see, if I want that envelope to happen faster, let me square the envelope. Here's an even sharper pluck. So remember the carrier never actually goes away. It's always there. So if you use this for a pluck sound, you would probably also want to follow it with an amplitude envelope on the whole thing. Let's see, if I wanted it to last longer in terms of having a lot of harmonics, I could do something like take a cube root. Yeah, with all of the harmonics present so strongly at the start, that's got a real harpsichord kind of vibe. Let me change this to 220 in terms of modulator. So that's kind of like a harpsichord, but it's got more of a square wave feel to the sound. Okay, let's try making some inharmonic sounds. Let's make the modulation frequency the same as the carrier, but we'll multiply it by the square root of two. Here we go. How about, let's now try 220 square root of two. There's definitely some artifacts in there. Mm -hmm. 
What about 55 square root of 2? Let me put that back at 220, and let's see. Let's maybe make the decay go a little bit faster. So how about something like this? Remember, the carrier is always in there, so that's why you heard that click at the end. There's no additional amplitude envelope that's been coded in here to make that smooth. The other thing to note is I'm always playing each sound normalized, so there may be some variations in overall loudness. Okay, so as a setup for what I want to talk about next, let me change this to 220 and change this to 55. So I have a carrier of 220 hertz and a modulation frequency that's a fourth of that. So let me also take that away. All right. So at the end there, you could hear that higher carrier. And one thing about this particular form of synthesis compared with FM is that FM has sidebands going both directions, positive and negative from the carrier. But this particular discrete summation formula that we've been using only has upper sidebands. But there's an alternative to this formula provided in this paper that creates upper and lower sidebands. And that's this formula right here. So let's try out this formula. That formula is the second XX formula that I have commented out here. Let me play the original formula again, just to have that in your mind. And now let's try out the new formula. And you can hear it converging to the carrier wave at 220 hertz, but at the beginning it sounds a lot bassier now. Let me play that again. You can now hear that partial at 55 hertz from the lower sidebands. Now here's a fun thing. If I put this at 220, Let's hear what that sounds like. <laughs> so with this formula, if you set the modulation frequency and the carrier frequency to be the same, then you wind up with the various sidebands when they cross the DC line and fold over, they wind up canceling each other, which I think is crazy. Let's see, we tried 55. What happens if we say, you have a carrier of 110 and we'll have a modulation frequency that's twice that. Let's see if we were to take that and now multiply it by the square root of 2. Let's get some inharmonics in here. That's now having more of an FM and a harmonic kind of vibe now that we have the upper and lower sidebands. Very clangorous. All right, let's try 55 times square root of two. <laughs> Okay, so you remember what happened when we set 
the carrier and the modulator frequency to be the same, everything zeroed out. What if I set the modulator frequency to 112 compared to 110 for the carrier? Oh, that's so interesting. So over the time of that note, notice that when it's in this upper part here, all of the samples are bigger than zero. Similarly, during this whole section of the sound, all of the samples are lower than zero. They're all negative. That is weird and wild. All right, let's see. What happens if I set this to 108? Oh, come on, give me a plot. Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? All right, how about 110.1? Okay, so over the course of these experiments, we've heard some aliasing. And that's not surprising because this summation formula that we see here goes up to infinity. But there's a more complicated version of that formula seen here where you can actually control what the highest partial n is. So that was for the first formula that we looked at that only had upper side bands. But if we take a look at this second formula that has infinite side bands going in either direction, Again, there's a more complicated version of it that lets you control the number of sidebands. So that's not really something you can do with standard FM. And you can imagine building a synthesizer, either in hardware or software or whatever, that would essentially look at whatever your fundamental is, figure out what the biggest N you can get away with and not alias, and choose that in accordingly in an adaptive fashion. Now, to my knowledge, there aren't any instruments that ever use this, at least not commercial ones. Oh, there's this little section in here about amplitude normalization, if in case you want to do that. And after all, at the time that this work was done, they wouldn't have been doing this in real time anyway. They would have been running some program, spitting out all of the audio as I've been doing actually, and then listening to it after the fact. And in fact, if you scroll down in the paper a little bit further, you can actually see where they talk about music V code. And music V is a progenitor to what's now called C sound. Anyway, I would encourage you to check out this paper and to try out my MATLAB code. And I would encourage you to check out other papers on the topic. I also wanted to mention this web page devoted to the Mopple synth VSTs. So let's see, there's the Sonitarium, Tetra, Mifi, and the Mopletron. So if we click on one of these, there's a general discussion about how these are all implemented using a variation of this kind of discrete summation formula. So there's a lot of cool stuff here. I'll include a link to this in the description below. Lots of stuff to experiment with.